In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, we got another great story. The Bible is just full of great stories. It's awesome stories. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city who was a sinner, a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointments. Now she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man were truly a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors who owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt for both of them. Now which of them will love him more, do you think? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I answered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head even with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is a parable about judging. About judgment. Who, who is worthy? Is Jesus worthy? Simon the Pharisee invited Jesus to his house to judge him. That's not a bad thing. That sounds like a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. We make judgments all the time. Simon wanted to know, is this dude who is a teacher, a rabbi, maybe a prophet, a healer, an exorcist, worth my time, worth my ear. Does he speak for God, a prophet? But how do you judge people? How do you judge that? What standards do you use to judge people? If I were to give you a list of 20 people, lawyers, doctors, ministers, teachers, CEOs, 35-year-old, um, unshaven, basement-dwelling, unemployed boys, um, you know, uh, prostitutes, as maybe this woman is, whatever. Almost completely, we would agree largely on how to rank them and how to judge them. We would. We know how to rank people. Now, we might not intellectually agree with all that ranking. We might argue where the teacher goes. They go higher or lower than certain people. Or where does the celebrity go? Are they really that important? Do they go below? But largely, we are using the same standards, the same worldly American cultural capitalist standards than everyone else in this world to judge how people are supposed to act, behave, What's respectable? What's the right way of doing things? One of my standards is a handshake. I like a good handshake. I like a good handshake. Now, everyone shakes hands differently, and that's okay, but there is an emotional part of me, like a precognition part of me, that if a good handshake, a good firm, but not too hard, you don't want to hurt someone. I shook a dude's hand yesterday. I mean, he was built. I mean, I'm like, ow! It was a little too firm. But sometimes you shake people's hands, and it's kind of like a limp, like softly cooked noodle. Like, I, I know that some people are more flexible than firm, and they're soft over hard, and they, advert, they like those things, and they're maybe afraid to touch. But there's, and I understand that. But there's things that we use to judge. Not in a bad way, just simple. I always dress down. In fact, I thought this morning when I put on my pants, I should probably iron these today. But I didn't. 
Now, I understand that I'm looking a little rumpled, and I personally don't care, but at the same time, I look at people, I'm like, man, that person's dressed really well right now. I like that. I just don't want to do it myself. And I am no different than anyone else who, who if a person comes dressed totally inappropriately to the wrong thing, and I, you know, that emotional side of me is like, I don't know about what that person's wearing. Even as I understand that I often wear the wrong thing to someone else's standard. Do you know how this works? I mean, listen, I'm, you know, it's just who we judge. We judge. And that's what Simon's doing. Is this guy Jesus worthy? Is he a prophet or not? But the Bible, the story is set up to highlight, almost highlight, without making an issue of it, that Simon's priorities are the world's priorities. Simon's standards are the world's standards. This is a nice meal. I believe Simon the Pharisee is probably a really good guy. But he's made it. He has succeeded in life. He could write a book. How to succeed in the Jewish world. You know, how to do it. He's a religious man. But he's yet reclining. They're reclining. So they're lying down at mats or they're lying on couches. It's a very Greco-Roman style of eating. Their heads are all facing the same direction. They're using the right hand, not the left hand, to eat, probably from the same plate, right? Jesus alludes to the fact that, hey, my feet should have been washed when I walked in, which is a sign of respectability. You should have put oil on my hair, which sounds a little greasy, but how often did they take showers? You know, if you can't join them, if you can't beat them, join them. You know, if you're going to be greasy anyways, you might as well smell and look greasy. So they oiled their hair. I mean, who oils their hair? I mean, People are looking at me, oil your hair. We'd like to get the oil out of our hair, right? But they don't have shampoo. I mean, they're oily, greasy people, and they stink to high heaven. I mean, it's a smelly place. Fragrant oil made the hair look glossy, and it covered up certain things. Right? So that's what you did. You treated people. This is a nice meal. It's a nice meal. Nice food. He had a nice dining room. Set. Luke is telling us, without having to tell us, that Simon is a worldly guy. He's going to judge by worldly standards. An almost extreme counterpoint is this woman that comes in. Who's ever been at, let's, let's do a wedding. You ever been to a wedding, and you're at the reception, and the groom, or what do we call the dude? The best man stands up, and they're supposed to give a toast, and they give a great toast. It's a great toast. They know what to say, what not to say. They know how long, how not, how not long. They talk about how wonderful the bride is. They have the right kind of humor. It's all about them, not about him. You know, it's a nice toast. And some people do it really, really well. And that, as far as I can tell, is the only quality to have a good best man. For those of you who aren't married, choose someone who can give good toast. And then maybe the bridesmaid. Do bridesmaids give toast? Bridesmaid gives a toast, and it's a nice toast, and it's great. And then kind of that oddball friend stands up. You know, who's always been a little strange, but you, you like him anyways, and they kind of hang out, but you're, boy, and you, you, you definitely invited, but you don't really want him to speak, and he stands up, or she stands up, and she gushes, or he gushes, and he goes on about this intimate story, and that intimate story, and how wonderful and lovely, and it's very personal, way too personal, and you start to, like, Oh, your soul starts to shrivel inside, and you're like, oh, this is getting really bad. Someone stop him or her. You've been there. You've not been the person, have you? All right. This happens, or it's a retirement party. You know, 60 years, someone's retiring. It's a nice, honorable kind of event. It doesn't get too intimate. But then like a newbie who's just new in the business or new in the firm or a new teacher, and they stand up, and they talk about how much they've been done, and it gets really intimate. And it's just, it just makes everyone else cringe. That's this woman. What this woman is doing is making everyone uncomfortable. Everyone. Everyone is cringing. Except for Jesus. Her sense of what's right and wrong, of what's how to do things and how not to do things, is very different. If she had come to me beforehand and said, Jesus has changed my life, and this is what I'm going to do, I would have been like, you know, I bet you Jesus would have really loved if he used that money instead to feed some people. You know, try to softly redirect. If I ever say stuff like that to you, there's an internal dialogue. This person's lost it. Like, softly redirect the people, okay? Because it was not a good thing that she's doing. 
She comes in, his feet are kind of sitting out, and you might wonder why she's there at all. Why, why is this strange sinner woman in the house? Different theories. My favorite is because Simon's a really good guy and he opens his house to people who need food. Why not? You don't have a better theory. He's got his kind of inner party where he wants to really kind of get to know people and has an opportunity to talk to people. He's a real socialite. But he's like, other people know they can come to Simon's house and eat. He's a good man. He's a good man. So here she is. She's there. She knows that Jesus is going to be there. There, was, there must have been a pre-dialogue. Something happened earlier in the day or the day before that changed her life, that really moved her. She has encountered Jesus and his teaching and his disciples and his group, and she felt something, was moved by something, experienced something that she has slept on, and she can't, she can't, she just can't handle it. She, she is so thankful and so moved. She goes and she gets this expensive oil, ointment, and she, she's going to go, and she just gets down at his feet, and she starts crying over his feet. It's not that she is doing something unacceptable only. It's that Jesus, in letting her do this, is also doing something unacceptable. Simon's right. Man, this woman has lost it. And she's a sinner. Was she a prostitute? There's a pretty decent chance of that, though we don't know for sure. But she lets down her hair, which is a very inappropriate thing to do. She's crying on his... She, people didn't dry other people's feet with their hair back then. Then she starts putting ointment on his feet, oiling and massaging. I mean, she just, man, like, oh, everyone is like, oh. It's not that Jesus can read Simon's mind, though you can believe that if you want. It's he knows what everyone is thinking. What is this? And so he says a little parable. Simon, let's pretend there's a, there's a creditor who's owed money. 50 days of wage from someone or a year and a half days. The denarii is a median size, median middle way. It's like a normal day's wage. And the, debt, the creditor knows that neither of them is going to be able to repay, so he just forgives both their debts. He forgives both their debts. Which do you think is going to be more thankful, the one that was owed a little or the one that was owed a lot? Well, I suppose the one who owed a lot would be more thankful. And Jesus says, you're right. You're right. Which is why I know this woman is forgiven. Your Bible will interpret that last part of Jesus' story a little differently. Was she forgiven because she showed a lot of love, which is the way that Bible did it, or did she show a lot of love because she had been forgiven, which is what makes sense given the parable. She showed a lot of love because she had been forgiven. She showed a lot of love because she knew she was worthwhile. Simon looks at this and says, oh, Jesus is not Jesus, Jesus isn't for real. Jesus isn't for real. He's not the right kind of person. Because he's letting her get away with what she's getting away with. But Jesus turns it around and says her actions, her generosity, her intimacy, her gratitude is exactly how we know She's the right kind of person. Exactly how we know she's the right kind of person. I was in a conversation with um, a friend of mine yesterday, actually, um, an acquaintance, and they were telling me about their vacation Bible school. It's a missionary Baptist church, which is a pretty fundamental Baptist church, kind of in the mountains. And the, 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 the church had a, a week-long vacation Bible school, and it went really, really well. And they were having an end-of-the-week ceremony, like a commencement. And this friend was saying, they had 30 teenagers there. 30 teenagers. Like, really impressed by that. It was, like, really effective. Really effective. And there were kids everywhere. And the preacher got up and gave a 45-minute sermon on how, if you don't have Jesus, you are not saved. And how everyone needed Jesus. And I would lay bets that included in that message was the notion that we are all sinners and we are all damned and we are all doomed if we don't really appreciate the blood of Jesus and the cross. And there's a reason why we do that in faith. It's a reason why that's done. It's because if you don't know how much Jesus has done for you, 
if you don't think Jesus needs to do anything for you, if you think that you got it all figured out already, and you're at the top of your game already, and you got it, you're, you're, you're one of God's great gifts already, as Simon seems to, then you won't be grateful for Jesus. And so the psychology is this. Make people feel miserable. This is the way the psychology works. It's not complicated. Make people feel miserable. Remind them again and again, every Sunday, of how great their sin is, so they, once again, every single Sunday, they remember how great their need is for Jesus. Now, most of you have sat through that service a time or two. And most of you are here because you want to sit through it as little as possible. But that doesn't mean that we don't need to be grateful for Jesus. See, Simon had an entitlement problem. He had an entitlement problem. He didn't think he needed anything from Jesus. He didn't think he needed anything more from God. He had it all already. He was entitled to God's favor. He was entitled to God's blessing. But this woman, this woman knew that she needed it because again and again and again she'd been reminded by people like Simon, good people like Simon and society, that she was not one of the favored ones. I can almost guarantee you when the Jesus encountered this woman the day before, let's pretend, or earlier that morning, he did not look at her and say, God, you're an awful sinner. Do you know how pathetic you are? Do you know that you're going to hell? Do you know you're going to burn forever? Do you know if you don't change your life, things aren't going to go well for you? Do you know how badly? I can almost guarantee you that is not even close to what he said to this woman so that she would come to him later that day and wipe his feet. You know what she encountered when she encountered Jesus and his group of outcast disciples was community, was an open arm. You know what they did? They sat down and they probably said, hey, you hungry? Do you want something to eat? Why does your teacher always eat with sinners and tax collectors? Why doesn't he wash his hands? It's because the people he's eating with don't wash their hands. They're the outcasts. They're the ones who just need to get through the day. They don't have time for the religious paraphernalia of self-righteous people. Have you ever sat down? We were with, in Morgan Scott, we built a ramp, a wheelchair ramp, for a husband and a wife who lived in a trailer. The trailer had no doors. It had no drywall, no paneling. All the electricity was hanging all over the place. It had no steps, just a deck that was... The woman had a severe stroke. She was in a wheelchair. She had spent many, many, many days, several weeks in the hospital. Depending on the gentleman, he came out and he had, you know, just kind of athletic shorts on, long hair, sunglasses, drinking a Mountain Dew, tattoos, no shirt. You know, just a good old boy from the mountains of Morgan Scott. And about telling me about what's happened to his wife. Just his story. I'm no judge. Just his story about what happened and how desperate their situation, how thankful he was we were building them this wheelchair ramp so he didn't have to carry her out anymore to go to the car. They, had no, they, just, had t- they just had towels and blankets hanging to keep the place insulated. The place was only good to be condemned. But here they are living in this place, and he offers you food. He offers you a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Raise your hand if you want to eat that peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Thank you, Liz. I, I, that's what Jesus did. It's one thing to take your own bread and break it and say, oh, yeah, you're one of me here. Oh, no, 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 no. No, you keep your own. It's another thing. You know, what if she cooked him dinner? What if, what if this woman who, who was a sinner woman, who was living on the margins of society, who was probably a prostitute, or we can imagine as such, what if she said, I just want you guys to come over to my house so I can feed you? That's when you really start to feel like, wait a minute, I'm not just an outcast to you. I am someone, I am one of you. 
You accept me for who I, you accept me. I don't, you, you love me. Something happened that moved her so much. She cried on the toes of Christ. I think it's because Jesus, not only, I think he included her. And that's not going to change everyone's life. When you include people, not everyone's going to change. Not everyone's going to respond with incredible generosity to that. But that's what that's the price that we pay by trying to share Christ with others. He did not encounter that woman with judgment. He encountered her with inclusion, with community. You are one with us. So that she might be able to actually do something different with her life now that she had community. And she responded in great generosity. <laughs> and we are supposed to respond with that same generosity. That same amazing generosity. With others. I think the message this morning is to be challenged by what it means to be touched by people you don't want to be touched by. To be in community with people who really need to know that they're not just outcasts, they're not just the untouchables, but really are people of worth and value and dignity and beauty, that they, God, God loves them through, through us, through us. And I think you need to work, we all need to work on that. So listen this morning for a message from God to you this morning.